Life is hard. After a busy day of work or school, the last thing any of us should want to do is come home and start playing a completely different, often more boring game. It doesn't make any sense. Or does it? In this video, we'll be looking at the reasons normal people love playing games that are duller than their real lives. We'll explore the psychological and social factors that have us labouring under the hot sun in farming simulators or trying to stay awake as we drive HGVs around Europe. And we'll discover that while it might look weird at first glance, our brains are actually wired to make us love this sort of experience. Here are six reasons we play games that are more boring than real life. To start with, we need to look at the psychology of how real-life employees are motivated to work. And, as ever, we're turning back to Jamie Madigan and his excellent website, The Psychology of Games. Madigan explains that the big factor at play here is something called self-determination theory. This explains what motivates people to engage in and persist with specific tasks. And it can be broken down into three areas – competence, autonomy and relatedness. And we'll explore all three of those in turn. Let's look at competence first. As you can probably guess, this deals with activities that allow us to get more skilled over time. With real jobs, this can be tricky. Many of us experience a rapid increase in competence after we start a new job. Then we gradually get more competent as we gain more experience. But there's usually a point where we stop improving. And as we've explored in a previous video about self-improvement, we may even get worse. But games are different. There's no backsliding here. We achieve a feeling of competence by winning matches, earning achievements and levelling up. And once we've gained those achievements, we never lose them. So if we build our haulage business in Euro Truck Simulator 2 and then step away for a month, nothing bad happens. It's an inherently satisfying feeling and one that's very different from real life where the battle to maintain competence is constant. And unlike real jobs, it's much easier to see the rewards your hard work is reaping. You know when you get better at something because the game tells you. You. Your progress is always measured, and there's a sense of progression that's often sadly missing IRL, where your chance for promotion is influenced by numerous external factors – your relationship with your boss, company structure, discrimination, etc. In games, it's almost always guaranteed, and it's a great feeling. Your boss might not recognise your worth in your actual job, but video games always will. <laughs> We'll talk about relatedness next. This is a cumbersome word for a simple concept. The idea that what we're doing feels important to other people. This loops back to the first entry and the external factors that affect progression in a real job. Essentially, we're much more motivated to do a thing if we can see it having a positive effect on the people around us, because it makes us feel important. We've all had jobs where you feel like all your hard work goes unnoticed and it kills your motivation. But positive feedback from peers and colleagues is great for intrinsic motivation. Your likes and comments, for example, make a huge difference. Go on, don't hold back. And games are much better at demonstrating relatedness than real life. This can be anything from getting play of the game in Overwatch to receiving praise when you've done something noble or heroic in a game. And to use a more sedate example, driving a train and getting all those pretend people to work on time is great for inspiring this feeling. Without you, they're going nowhere, and that's reason enough to keep playing. And finally, for self-determination theory, we've got autonomy. This is the thing games always do better than real life. In our working lives, there are other factors influencing the decisions we make. Our relationship with others, increasingly complicated tasks, the fear of change or even redundancy. But in games, the choices are all ours, right down to whether we play or not. Even the decision to give it all up and become a train driver is a demonstration of autonomy. In real life, most of us don't have a choice about whether we go to work or not. And video games are always idealised versions of jobs. We get to make choices we never could in real life, with all bureaucracy and restrictions stripped away. There are plenty of good reasons we can't just hop in a real truck and start driving, but games always trust us to do the right thing. And on top of this, the exact manner we execute tasks in games is always up to us. We decide what route to take, which crops to plant, and even exactly what colour of leopard print spots to put on our customised French bulldogs. In our working lives, most of these decisions belong to someone else, and taking control in games feels hugely liberating. And there's another factor in play here that we touched upon when we mentioned bureaucracy and restrictions. In games, we can do whatever we want without fear of reprisal. We can take risks we never would in real life, and we'll explore that next. Yes, we're talking about lack of consequences. In games, we can do whatever we want. We can give up our accountancy job to enter the world of competitive fishing without any serious effects. 
But in real life, all these decisions obviously have huge repercussions. We could fail, we could lose opportunities in our current job, we could end up destitute, but games let us try these things without consequences. And that's why a game like My Summer Car still appeals, even if you do spend your day fixing real life vehicles. Madigan describes how they remove the uncertainty, helplessness, ambiguity and consequences for failure that come with these real world jobs. And, better still, games give us repeated bites of the same employment cherry. Real life often only gives us one opportunity to get a task right, and that pressure can be paralysing. But with games, once we've finished constructing a town or driving a train, we can start again and try something totally different. Or we can repeat the same task over and over until we're happy with the results. Combine this with the factors we mentioned before, distinct goals, clear feedback and guaranteed progression, and you can see why these sorts of games are more rewarding than the real thing. So we've hopefully established why we love playing boring jobs in games, but what about even more monotonous games that let us build virtual environments and manage them? Well, it turns out we've got good reason for playing those too. Stay with us here, but apparently these time-wasting games might actually be a subconscious way of displaying that we're good life partner material. A Guardian article that we've linked in the description explains how evolutionary psychology might explain why we get such joy from building the perfect house in The Sims or smoothly running a vault in Fallout Shelter. It's called the theory of signalling. In the article, game designer and fun theory author Raf Koster explains that these things work as a signal of our conscientiousness and that they communicate our best qualities to others. He uses a well-tended garden as an example. This is a public signal of how responsible and dutiful you are and how good you are at taking care of things, which in turn could be a signal that you'd be a good parent. And the gaming equivalent to that might be a perfectly organised virtual world or an efficiently running plot in Plants vs Zombies. On a similar level, this might all be a way to make ourselves look better than others. In the same article, cyber psychologist Bernie Good describes the peacock effect. This is the idea that an individual will go to great lengths and expense to show others their possessions, all in order to demonstrate their wealth and worth. In real life, this might be driving an ostentatious car, but in games, it's as simple as sharing your immaculate Sims mansion with strangers. And that brings us neatly to our final entry. If we're already experiencing the grind of daily life, why on earth would we want to recreate it in The Sims? Well, we've got another article explaining exactly why, this time from Psychology Today, which reveals that playing The Sims is not unlike a session on a psychologist's couch, and probably cheaper. Not only can you make all the choices that we've previously discussed so are in complete control of the minutiae of everyday life, but The Sims is an exercise in human needs. Sims creator Will Wright, who also happens to be a philosopher specialising in human behaviour, had to make sure that you understand the moral reasons behind the decisions you make. Do you buy a washer-dryer combo or a phone to communicate with fellow Sims? What's more important, saving time or speaking? In turn, these are the decisions that we make every day, and we want to make sure that they're the right ones for us. Plus, if the first thing you do when you load up The Sims 4 is create yourself, you're not alone. We all do it and we can even learn things about ourselves in the process. Comparative media studies professor Henry Jenkins explains that the realistic environment that The Sims creates actually lets you process real life situations. Why did that relationship go wrong? Watching it in pixels can be helpful and let you process the situation. If you'd like to see more on just how The Sims works in a psychology situation, let us know and we'll dedicate a future episode to just this. And there you go, six reasons we can't resist the allure of real-time train journeys and slowly, agonisingly constructing your own car. Please give us a like if you prefer pretend jobs to your real one, let us know in the comments what your favourite boring distraction is, and subscribe to Logitech G for more weekly shows and features.